Today's scriptures come from John and John. (laughs) Uh, The Gospel of John as well as 1 John. Now, the Gospel of John is written, we're not 100% certain it's written by the disciple John. Either way, if if it was written by him or not, Whoever wrote it uh, had him right there with him. It was kind of like he, they were doing it together. It was a co-author. Um, but we do know the letters, 1 John, um, 2 John, and 3 John, were all written by the disciple John. So it, either way, they're both all written by the same guy, but maybe there was a co-author on the first part. And this first one, what you'll see in all of these, John emphasizes love. And he emphasizes completely how Christ's, God's love for us changes us and brings a bright, shining light into the world. And so when we read these passages, it's it's amazing to me that one of the most famous passages in Scripture, in in John uh, 3.16, when you look at 1 John 3.16, it's almost identical. And, and it just is exciting to see how this, those, these, two gospels, these two books were written 20, 30 years apart. And how the same passion was in this man saying, you've got to love God like this. So, with that, let us read this familiar passage, but maybe hear it for the first time. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, and then 16 through 18. Dear friends, since God loved us, We also ought to love one another. Sorry, I have it written up so many places. There we go. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. I'm in the wrong chapter. Back to the other one. Sorry, I told you it's all over the book. 1 John 3, 11. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother or sister in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear friends, dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Lord, love came down at Christmas. Sometimes in this world, we're not sure what, what love really is. We're not sure if love is even here. I guess that's why you came. You came to show us what love is. And so Christ, oh God, we need you today. We need you to illuminate our hearts and show us the way of life and love. We need you today to be with us. Lord, Your love came down at Christmas in one of the most tangible ways imaginable. Through a little baby that grew into a man, that grew into a lover of everyone. And it became our risen Savior. Lord, that changes us. That transforms our way of thinking. That changes our way of life. And so, Lord, today, as we look at these two passages and we explore this next step in the message of Christ and the message of Christmas, may we, may we be open to you. Holy Spirit, may you illuminate our hearts and may it be your words that are heard today and not mine. May it be your way that we follow and not just our own. In your name we pray. Amen. 
one of the things I love about the Christmas season is all the Christmas specials that come on. And my, one of my absolute favorites, well, you, if you looked on Facebook, one of my all-time favorite movies, It's a Wonderful Life, was on last night. But we'll talk, we're not talking about that one today. We'll do that later. Today we're talking about, I'm going to start talking about the, the Charlie Brown Christmas special. And that one is just classic. 50 years old today, or this year. It's been around for 50 years. And it's a powerful story. I mean, you got to love peanuts in and of themselves. And I don't know which one you identify with most. Are you Linus or Lucy or Charlie Brown? If you're Lucy, we might need to talk about your need to always be right. But I love, one of the things I love best about that is, is the scene where Linus goes out on the stage and he tells Charlie Brown what Christmas is all about. If you've seen it, or if you've not seen it, and, and you need to see it, let me know. I have it on DVR. Um, but if you can picture, go back into your mind, and the little cartoons in your mind, and, and, and Charlie Brown is, has just, he's, he's trying to understand the meaning of Christmas. And, and he is, is all frustrated because he goes and he, he sees this tree that, that just is a weakling little tree and, and he brings it back to the whole gang and he says, look, I got a Christmas tree and, and he sets it on the piano and they're like, that's a nothing tree. That's a loser tree. What the heck? That is blue. And they just start berating him like they typically do. And Charlie Brown just devastated and at wit's end goes, can somebody please tell me what Christmas is all about? And Linus, in his blanket of wisdom, walks out on the stage and he says, I can, Charlie Brown. Lights, please. That's my favorite part where he's like, lights, please. And click, it all goes. And lo, and he goes into the story of Christ. And the arrival of the birth and the fact that, that God came and told the shepherds, the outcasts, the ones that were just like that little tree, told them first, guess who's here? And he says then that the angels rejoiced and, and he then tells Charlie Brown that the baby came because he brought peace on earth and goodwill to everyone. And he walks off and he says, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Wow. It's going to make me cry just thinking about it. What a powerful little story. That's what Christmas is all about. Christ's love and peace and the true fact that God came first to the, to the broken and to the needy, not to the rich and powerful. He came first to those that that really had their hearts open and wanting it. You know, I, I, I think about that and I think about why was it that that was important? Why was it that he came? Why, why in the world did it matter to him that we know peace and goodwill? And, and I realized that why? What Christmas is really all about, why that peace and goodwill matters is because of love. Because of God's unconditional, undying, unending, unwavering, amazing, undescribable love for all of humanity. Look at that thought for a moment. Think about it. Look at this idea of, of unconditional, beautiful love for the wholeness of humanity. That he came, he wanted good for us. He wants hope for us, love for us, wholeness for us, wholeness for the broken, wholeness for the little trees that can't hold up an ornament, wholeness for the shepherds, wholeness for the hurting. And the whole reason he wants all that is because he loves us. Maddie, if you'd put up that first scripture slide. This is a powerful statement, and, and I think sometimes, in, in not as much in our world today, but I know when I was growing up, everybody, whether you went to church or not, in, at least in my culture, in my community, everybody could quote this first part of the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his, one, his only begotten son, that whoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I never focused on memorizing it. It was just repeated to me all the time around me, and it just happened. 
I think sometimes we maybe miss some of the steps in here because what we do is we tend to focus on the, you got to believe in Christ and now you're saved. But we miss some of the other pieces that are right here. So to give you a little history, what this is, this comes from a, a, a chapter 3 of, of the Gospel of John. We, we, we meet Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is um, a Jewish Pharisee. He's a leader in the church who's beginning to realize that Christ has the more powerful message. He's beginning to realize that Christ is the Messiah. And if we remember when we've talked about Easter and so forth, that, that the, the Pharisees and Christ were always in tension um, because he was pushing back against their religious ways that were not reflecting God's love. And so the fact that a Pharisee is coming to him and saying, wait, you maybe have this right. And so Nicodemus is trying to understand all this. He's trying to get what's going on and, and to understand as well what's happening in here. The Jewish people, um, they are living in, in Jerusalem, but Jerusalem is under Roman rule. And, and this is their land. This is where they, this was their town, their place. And so what Rome did, they had conquered this land and they said, instead of killing you all, we're just going to demand that you pay tribute. And, and so you pay tribute to us and we won't hurt you. And so that, but that, that's the whole taxes, the ta why the tax collectors were negative to everybody, because they were Jewish people that were collecting money for the Roman government that was oppressing them. And that was just not a cool thing. I mean, I'd hate to have that job, but you had that job. And a lot of them decided to become kind of um, corrupt in that. And they'd be like, well, the, if the government charges 20, I'll charge 40 and keep 20 for myself. And so they, they, they were living in this state, in this situation where spiritually they were, were, being, they were being broken. They were, the government was trying to break their spirits, trying to break them and get them under control and, and, and put them under uh, uh, oppression. And, and, and then uh, physically they were literally not capable of doing everything they wanted to do. They couldn't necessarily go just anywhere because they had to deal with <clears throat> whether or not the Roman government was going to allow them to. And, and then emotionally and, and mentally, you're dealing with this anger, this frustration. And so here, the Pharisees are trying to lead their people and, and trying to, to deal with this balance. And this, what do we do? How do we keep their spirits alive while we're also being oppressed? And so you've got this tension building up. And some are like, let's just not rock the boat. And Nicodemus is realizing that's not working. And he's also realizing... That the men and women out there who are saying we just need to have a big war and overthrow the government, we need to overthrow the Romans, all these people who are being mean and oppressive to us, we need to just overthrow them. And, and Nicodemus is like, that's not going to work either because then what happens, we still live in this tension. And we've, we've, we've hurt other people and, and we've, we've won our freedom by force, not, not by, by faith and by self and by strength. It, it becomes where, where other people have, have been now become oppressed. And is that any good that we harm somebody else who's been harming us? And so Nicodemus is trying to ex understand this. And he hears Christ's teachings and he's like, Lord, is, what, what does this mean? What are you telling me? And so what Christ says, because he's trying to understand, what, why, why do I have to be born again? That's one of the things that Christ says right before this. He says, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, how can I crawl back into my mom? And Jesus is like, you don't have to crawl back into your mom. This is a figure of speech. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's kind of funny, I thought. When I, he's like, how do I get back in my mom? You don't get back in your mom. That's like kind of in scripture, but that's my paraphrase. Sorry, I forgot to turn off Star Wars. Um, and so, so he asks this. He asks this to find this out. And, and Christ says, you got to be born again in your thinking and in your spiritual soul and in what drives you. He says, look, this is what drives God. And he clicks this thought into Nicodemus. And he says, for God so loved the world. And, and the first bit there is just screws with Nicodemus' thinking. Because he's been teach, taught God loves the Israelites. God loves the chosen people. But Christ is saying God loves the world. He doesn't do any other qualifier. And that just throws him for a loop. Because he's like, I, I do not understand. What do you mean? He loves the Romans? Those jerks that are stealing our money and taking our land? Christ is like, yeah. And he clicks the switch. And he says, look. God 
loves the world. Everybody. Because everybody is my creation. I made every human. I made every thing, every blade of grass, every sand in the sea, every, every, everything. The Holy Spirit made it. And so he says that he sent me to show you you're loved. Everybody's loved. We cannot correct this imbalance that's going on in our culture through hate and anger and fighting. The only way we can correct it is by accepting and understanding this idea that God so loved the world. Everybody. All of us. That he gave his one and only son to everybody. That anyone who chooses to exchange and engage in that love has the chance to have holy, holistic, eternal life. Anybody. Not just people like us. Anyone. God didn't send his son to condemn everybody. He sent his son to embrace them, to love them and say, hey, you want to be with me? You want to know you're loved? Come on. The, the image that I gave, that I gave the kids about the dog coming up and just loving you and excited that you're there. It's that kind of unconditional, I love you. Not as black and white as a dog, but you, you know what I mean. <laughs> so think about that for a second. How does Christ's complete and utter unconditional love for us change us? How does that transform who we are? How does that transform and drive the way we live? The way we exist? The way we experience the world around us? You see, if Christ loves us unconditionally and he loves absolutely everybody, and I, let me emphasize that, God loves all of creation, all of humanity. You mean he loves that person who's a jerk to me? Thought, yeah, God loves him too. You mean he loves my enemy? Yes. You mean God loves fundamental Islamic terrorists? Yeah, just like he loves fundamental Christian terrorists. Do they re Turn the love to him? Not necessarily, but does that change his love? No. Perhaps the best example of this is the story of the prodigal son. You see that story where it is a, a, a father who has two sons, two, two sons, <laughs> two sons, and one son stays and, and is committed to walking in, in, and living with his dad and showing that love, and the other one says, forget you, dad, I'm going to bail on you. And, dad, and he goes off and he does all his own thing for a long time. And he eventually comes back home. Well, that whole time in the story, we come to learn that the dad has never stopped loving his son, but he's allowed his son to go off and do his thing. His son has gone off, he squanders all his money, he wastes everything he has, he gets rid of it all, and he realizes how his anger and hatred towards his dad, how unhealthy that was and unholy that was. And he comes back and he says, please, will you forgive me? I will, I will work in the stables and not even come near the house if you'll at least put a roof over my head. And his father embraces him and grabs hold of him and says, I love you because you have come back and you're repenting. That whole time, though, nothing changed. His love, the father's love for his son never changed. He always was hoping. Hoping that his son would be better. Hoping that more could be there. And so when we think about Christ's love for us and his whole reason for coming is because he wanted to show us that God loves the world unconditionally. Now, you know, we, we've named this series uh, Coming Home for Christmas. And we spent a long time this um, uh, summer and fall talking about the journey to growing in Christ, the journey 
closer to the holy, the journey closer to, to understanding who God is and, and to coming home. And, and, and when I think about this unconditional love, I, I think about, for me, my home. My home and that love of home, that love of, of, of that family time. I, 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 I ask you guys, just kind of get an image in your mind right now. It might not be your, your biological family, but there's, there's a, a group that you know you call home. There is, there is a group of men and women, adults and kids, that, that when you feel they're your family, how does their existence, their presence in your life change you? How does that sense of, of unconditional, I am loved and accepted no matter what by these people, change you? Think about those moments. Think about how that unconditional love fills your soul. You know, this, this, this idea of family and, and acceptance and, and, and it not having to be a biological family, it, is, it, it extends beyond just the church and, and, and into all sorts of other ways. Several years ago, when, when Christmas fell on, on a Sunday, um, I stayed overnight here Christmas Eve. I, usually, I go back to Tulsa. Christmas Eve and, and, and it's hard because I want to be with my family but I couldn't be with my family that night and, and my youngest, younger sister came and so I had some family here and that was great but David and Nancy Shore knew that I wasn't able to be with family that night and that Sarah and I my younger sister while we were here together that, that they wanted to make sure we had a place and so they invited us over for dinner and we hung out and we stayed at their house for hours after the service and just enjoyed family together. And they're not here this morning to get me to like tell them thank you again. But in that moment I felt I'm loved. I'm family. It doesn't matter who I am. I'm important. And I'm valuable to you. My um, parents have been in the house they live in now for about 15, 16 years, and it's not the house I grew up in. Um, I guess maybe they moved to lose me, but they didn't. You know. um, and, and, but they, they built the house. They did their own construction and all. And, all in. and, and one year, kind of, um, it was at Thanksgiving time, and, and the house, we were, they were hopefully going to be into the house um, just after Christmas. And, and it was, all the family was home, and they decided, hey, let's, let's go over to the house and let's christen it. And so all the kids, and, and my nephews, I think the youngest was like three. And, or no, 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 he must, he was probably four. And, and, um, and we're all there and we're running around the house and they're showing us what it's going to be and all this. And, and we even go outside and break a bottle of champagne on the house. It took like three tries, but we did. And we go into the house and, and, and uh, they, instead of champagne, we, we do uh, sparkling grape juice. And, and we, we're all standing in what will eventually be the, the den, the family room den area. And, and dad is there and, and he, we pass around sparkling grape juice and, and we've got everybody, the adults and the kids and grandparents and, and my nephew Justin, the four-year-old, we, we've put him up on a countertop and like all four-year-olds, his feet are flipping back and forth and we keep hearing this banging on the cabinet below us and, and, and we, we were passing around and we're going to do a toast to the house and we're going to pray over the house and bless it as a family and my dad says, so, so what should we toast to? And this beautiful four-year-old voice cries out, to love! And we all start to laugh and say, yes, Justin, and he gets all embarrassed. But here was this four-year-old who was just having fun and he knew exactly what that house meant. He was loved. He knew exactly what was happening, even if he didn't understand all the grown-up words. That we were toasting to love. Because that's what God gave us. In the second half of the, the passage that we talked about today, it, it, or that we brought up, go to the next one, Maddie. It, it starts off, if you read the right ones instead of the ones that I started reading. Next, then, Maddie, Maddie, there we go. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. We should love one another. 
And when we love one another, God's love is made complete in us. The reason for Christmas happens when we love one another. It is made complete and whole and we feel it and we know it. And I have to tell you, love is not easy. Do I have an amen? <laughs> it is not easy. But it is a commandment from Christ to do. But Christ doesn't say, love's going to be easy, so do it. He says, just do it. you got to work through it, but do it. And one of the beautiful things, one of the things I love best about love is that when you have worked through the hard times, when you have fought through and you have committed to the relationship and to the love of one another, and you get on the other side of the hard time, that love tastes even sweeter, even better, even richer, even more fulfilling. In my family, we are a blended family, and, and I, I never, ever realized what that was until I was uh, an adult, really, because there was this complete commitment in my family to have all of us were welcome and all were included. And I remember when I was about 15 years old, um, it was around Christmas time, and, and uh, mom and dad had it thrown a big Christmas party the night before, and I was in the kitchen helping mom put away the silver and the nice stuff, and we were kind of cleaning it, polishing it, and, and just talking. And I was like, Mom, you know, tell me more about the fact that my older siblings, you know, what that was like when they came into the, into the family. Because I thought they had been there since the very beginning. But you see, they moved in with my mom and dad in 1974. Mom and dad got married in 73, and in 74, my father got full custody of all three of his children. And then I was born in 76. And so in that time frame, um, I didn't realize until that conversation that there was a year, a year and a couple of months that, that my mom and dad, they didn't have my older siblings there. And I assumed, because I absolutely, completely and adored my older siblings, that, that my mom and dad didn't have a problem. My mom didn't have a problem of loving it. And she's like, I loved them. But I wasn't ready to be a mom yet. I go, what do you mean? I said, didn't, didn't, weren't you so excited that you got to be a mom to Jill, David, and Jill? She's like, well, no, I was 26, 27, and there was going to be a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old, and an 8-year-old suddenly in my life, and I didn't know what to do. Oh. I said, so did you love him? She says, yeah. She says, but that's not what mattered. She says, I loved your father enough to deal with the things that he brought to the table. I loved your father so much that I was going to learn to love his children. I loved your father so much that I was going to embrace them as my own eventually. She said, it took several years to wrestle with the difficulties there. But I committed to it because I loved your dad. We're a strong family now because of that. And you see, it's that same love that Christ calls out to us to do. I love God, our Father, so much that I'm willing to learn to love His people that are difficult to love. I love God, our Father, so much that when Dave cracks a dumb joke, I'm still going to love him. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Especially. <laughs> I love God our Father so much that when I am hurt or when I feel the brokenness of someone else and their hurt towards me, I will forgive and move forward because the family of God is more important than my own frustrations. I love God so much that I am going to put His people first. You see, that family, that's who we are. And we have to have that kind of love as a family. So that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. It's about loving God and His unconditional love for us and learning to love each other because we love God first. Christ loves you. He loves you. So let's return that love by loving one another. Amen.